Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos los que están aquí reunidos para esta conferencia, el doctor Roger David Cornberg, premio Nobel, por cierto, si me enteré de que o seu pai, que también fue premio Nobel, estivo en nuestra universidad, en esta ciudad, evidentemente, hay 30 años aproximadamente. O sea, quién, quién sabe, a lo mejor o seu hijo Gil, o, o pequeño que nos acompaña, pues dentro de unos pocos años, ahí me quedan unos cuantos, pero bueno, podría estar también visitándonos. No sé si es en condición de premio Nobel o no, pero en todo caso sí que lo celebraremos. Bueno, nos acompañan aquí, además de eh, do profesor Luis Castedo, que es el padrino del conferenciante, catedrático noso, o profesor Jorge Mira, que como seguro que todas y todos saben, es nuestro director del programa, do exitoso programa Conciencia. Está también con nosotros dona Mercedes Rosón Ferreiro, que es consejera delegada de Urbanismo y Vivienda, que precisamente va a ser ella quien primero toma palabra. Profesor Castelo, Mira, profesor Comber, señoras y señores, muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos. En mi nombre, el alcalde presidente del Consorcio de la Ciudad, y para el Consejo y para todos los compostelanos, es un placer presentar a Roger David Comber, que está hoy aquí para hablar de la ciencia básica como esperanza para el progreso humano. Antes de nada, gustaría me sublinear la dimensión de la conferencia que impartirá hoy. En nuestro país estamos afeitos a que la cultura se centre en los aspectos más humanísticos y e sociales, existiendo una discriminación o un valeiro a la hora de achegar o conocimiento científico a la población. Por otra banda, a veces esquecemos que la cultura es ciencia y a viceversa, que la ciencia también es fundamentalmente cultura. E é cultura porque es una creación humana, porque es el resultado del talento, de la curiosidad y del amor por el conocimiento. De aquella, la ciencia también puede ser gozo. Así como disfrutamos leyendo una boa, una boa novela, un dao teatro o escuchando una canción, también podemos gozar aprendiendo cosas sobre la naturaleza que nos rodea. Y e al tiempo que el conocimiento científico nos hay un poquito más sabios, también nos puede ser de utilidad. Como tengo explicado estos días, el profesor Juan Ver, en los medios de comunicación, aprovechar económica y socialmente un descubrimiento básico no es una cuestión meramente científica, sino que en este proceso entra en su a legalidad y los apoyos administrativos y e económicos. Junto a interés político e empresarial, la sociedad tiene que estar preparada para aprovechar los logros de investigación. Es también fundamental que aquellos que quieran dedicarse a investigación tengan la oportunidad de hacerlo. Desgraciadamente, adulto, estos factores pesan más que el ánimo de la comunidad científica. Por último, gustaría me lembrar que el conocimiento científico forma parte de los derechos humanos, porque es un derecho del ser humano estar capacitado individual y colectivamente para tomar decisiones. Con este objetivo, naceu hace tres años el programa Conciencia, apoyado desde su creación por el Consejo de Santiago de Compostela a través del Consorcio de Ciudades en colaboración con universidades. Jorge Mira y el profesor Castedo. Eh, presentarnos ahora al profesor Conver. Eh, a mí eso me queda agradecer los sus esfuerzos por contribuir y crear un entrelazo entre la ciencia y la sociedad. Eh, para nosotros es un honor que, hace, que aceptase ir a Compostela, que con, a través también de este programa Conciencia consolida, consolida Santiago de Compostela como una ciudad de conocimiento. Muchísimas gracias a todos y a todas por estar esta noche aquí. La verdad es que es un placer ver cómo está, pues, en un día tan caluroso, tan, tan ya casi de gran, en pleno mes de Sámez, pues este, este magnífico eh, teatro, pues, cheo de gente que ven a, a escuchar esta conferencia. Nada más, muchas gracias. Bueno, gracias Mercedes. Ahora unas palabras mías breves. A continuación, Mercedes y e nos sentaremos de antes y a continuarán los profesores Mira y e Castedo presentando a nuestro ilustre conferenciante. Pero permítame primero eh, pues, eh, celebrar este magnífico programa Conciencia. Cuando fue concebido, pues era un, un ambicioso sueño. Eh, sabíamos que, que no exento de dificultades y e desde luego pensábamos, ainda que eh, con incluso ciertas dosis de ingenuidad, 
pensábamos que no iba a tener o éxito, ni imaginábamos o éxito que iba a tener. La verdad es que o tiempo y e los esfuerzos de mucha gente, particularmente el profesor Mira, el eh, compromiso del consorcio desde el primer momento, la gente que apoya este programa, pues la verdad que estamos tremendamente satisfechos. E no solo por traer cada año cuatro o cinco premios Nobel o equivalentes, que es realmente difícil, sino sobre todo eh, por ter conseguido, o que sea era un objetivo desde el principio, que estas personas eh, no pasaran fugazmente por la ciudad pues, a dar una charla, sino que realmente se detiveran en ella, estuvieran interaccionando con nos, hicieran mucho más que dar unas cuantas charlas y además incluso hicieran un esfuerzo por achegar al conjunto de la sociedad eh, o su conocimiento. Esto es fundamental. E precisamente para que toda la ciudad, y muy gente que por cierto ven a asistir a estas conferencias de toda Galicia, para que percibieran que estas personas y e su conocimiento se entreveraban en el conjunto de la ciudadanía, era importante también ir moviéndonos por distintos lugares. Los espacios físicos son importantes también. La posta en estrella, y e quizás nunca mejor dicho, es muy importante también para este tipo de interacciones con la ciencia. Este teatro principal, no que tuve la fortuna de estar algunas veces, por cierto, nunca de este lado, siempre, siempre de otro, ahora de su de medio escénico, ¿no? es decir, todo apagado, no vos veis las caras, vos nos está desvendándonos. Eh, es realmente impactante. ¿no? Pero este teatro principal, donde tantos y e tan eh, eventos de tipo cultural se realizan, hoy se tiene otro evento eh, muy singular que también es cultura. Eh, o decía la consellera, es decir, la ciencia también es cultura. E de hecho, las eh, ciencias o todos los ámbitos de saber, porque hoy, este año que cumplimos, que se celebran los 50 años, eh, de aquella conferencia de Snow, las dos culturas que tanta pegada, tantísima pegada de show e Inda de Xará. Pues eh, 50 años después, lo que percibimos es que no solo hay dos culturas, más o menos enfrentadas o divididas o separadas, sino que hoy hay eh, una manchea de culturas. Es decir, realmente cada ámbito de conocimiento es casi un ámbito de especialización tan, tan vasto que es muy difícil incluso una superficie poder acercarse a él. Bueno, una forma de hacerlo, una forma de eh, achegarse a los distintos ámbitos científicos, eh, quererlos, respetarlos y al final, eh, quién sabe, incluso algunas vocaciones se abrirán aquí o se eh, acentuarán aquí, pues eh, el programa Conciencia estamos seguros de que también en este sentido es un programa de enorme interés. Por la mía parte nada más, agradecerles a todos y a todas a su asistencia. Sin eso carecería de sentido realmente este programa. E precisamente eso que nos reafirma cada curso académico en continuar. Y e por supuesto a quien también nos hace eh, útil, que el profesor Kornberg en este caso. Le agradecemos mucho pues, que continúe con la saga familiar. Espero que además sea una saga eh, que después nos, nos visiten nuestros tíos, nuestros netos. Que la saga Kornberg sea realmente una saga de Santiago de Compostela. Estoy seguro de que sí será. Gracias. Bueno, y ahora, como les avancé, Mercedes, eh, baixamos, y ya quedan las manos del profesor Mira. <risa> Esperamos a que se senten con cuidado porque esto es peligroso. Bueno, buena tarde. Eh, Rector magnífico de la Universidad de Santiago. Señora Concellera Delegada de Urbanismo y Vivienda, Profesor Kornberg, Luis, es realmente una y más espectacular estar en el estrado de la tabla porque el espectáculo que un tan cuando levanta a vista, con todas estas pequeñas lucecinas ahí arriba y la gente que se ve en la penumbra, da bastante bien. Yo no sé si el profesor Kornberg estuvo alguna vez en esta, en esta circunstancia, pero veo que la idea de escoger este teatro fue boa. Por lo menos su marco es bastante bo. Esperemos que no caiga ningún por las escaleras abajo, entonces quedaría todo perfecto. O programa Conciencia este año llega a su cuarta edición, eh, plenamente consolidado. Evendo, además, OSE, que el día 15 de junio, con los estudiantes sin exámenes, este cheo, pues realmente avala que la a, a implantación sigue funcionando. Y e sigue funcionando también por los sus invitados, porque el profesor Kornberg 
tivo o pasado venres unha roda de prensa na que demostrou ser o invitado modelo posto que fixo declaracións bastante impactantes e bastante valerosas indicando que debe haber un financiamento en ciencia básica mesmo saio se publicado na Voz de Galicia que o problema para a solución de certas enfermidades non é un problema científico, sino un económico tivo intensísimos contactos cos grupos de investigación da Compostela tivo un encontro no Centro de Estudos Avanzados con varios investigadores e ademais conheciu e creo que lle encantou Galicia porque apateou bastante fiz un percorrido cultural bastante intenso e dentro logo teño que dicir que é unha persoa super educada, moi agradable agradecida por todo e quero destacar que el hai apenas dúas semanas estivo en Valencia para os xurados do premio Xaime I por certo, este ano gañou un catedrático desta universidade o profesor Ángel Carracedo que está ali sentado e a quen aproveito para felicitar publicamente o profesor Cornberg tiña o acto de licenciatura da súa filla no instituto foi outra vez a California a ese acto e poucos días despois está de volta aquí é dicir, que se metiu entre peito a espalda pois tres viaxes transoceánicas o que hai de agradezo é todo un detalle como sempre hai un padriño para cada visitante neste caso é un padriño que xa conhece o programa que é o profesor Luis Castedo que hai apenas seis meses estaba facendo de padriño de Barry Sharples e agora está aquí el xa tivo ocasión de conhecer ao pai do profesor Cornberg a Arthur Cornberg Luis Castedo ademais hai apenas 15 días celebraba pois unha especie tiña unha especie como de amenase onde merecidamente se lle rendeu tributo ao seu gran labor se lle concedeu a Isinha de Ordo da Universidade é realmente el o padrino ideal porque demostra o talento do Departamento de Química Orgánica é realmente é unha afición excelente como demostrou nada máis salvo recordar que dentro de uns meses no segundo semestre teremos o acto de concesión do Premio Fonseca ao profesor James Lovelock e habrá o cuarto e último invitado do programa Conciencia que iremos anunciando a través dos medios de comunicación que quero agradecer de unha vez máis a súa chega, porque os medios de comunicación son esa porta que comunica o traballo dos que facemos o programa Conciencia coa xente que está aquí que é o gran público. Nada máis, salvo reiterar o agradecimento do reitor ao Concello de Santiago e ao Consorcio por ese apoio tan decidido que están dando a este programa que, como decimos sempre, é posiblemente o programa de comunicación de ciencia de máis impacto social de Galicia. De iso vos con Luís Castedo e vou pedir a Saúl Beceiro que é un moi bo estudiante de física que coñece moi ben os maquintos a que cambie de presentación e non, minimiza e ponga letras aí estamos, ora perfecto grazas Saúl e deixe vos con Luís Castedo, moitas grazas Bueno, buenas tardes a todos Magnífico e estudiantísimo señor doctor, autoridades amigos Roger, Jorge é para mi un gran placer e un inmenso honor el poder presentar hoy aquí al profesor Roger Farnberg que é catedrático de biología estructural de una de las universidades más importantes de los Estados Unidos como es la Universidad de Stanford. Nació en 1947 en San Luis y eh, realizó los estudios de la carrera de química en otra de las universidades más prestigiosas de los Estados Unidos como es la Universidad de Harvard, finalizando dichos estudios en 1967. A continuación se fue a la, otra, a la otra costa, al oeste, para realizar su doctorado de nuevo en la Universidad de Stanford y en el área de la química física. Y eh, finalizó dichos eh, trabajos en el año 1972 y a continuación se desplazó a Europa a un famoso laboratorio de biología molecular de Cambridge en donde permaneció Uh, tres años, primero como becario postdoctoral 
y eh, el último año ya incluso como científico de plantilla. La relevancia de este laboratorio está acreditada por el hecho de que cuando él llegó allí eran unos cinco premios Nobel los que había, uno por planta. En, en Cambridge colaboró con un eh, químico, un gran especialista en cristalografía, que, era, que es el profesor Club, y también en microscopía electrónica, y además con un excelente bioquímico, Francis Crick, que fue premio Nobel eh, de eh, Fisiología. Una vez finalizada esta etapa, se uh, trasladó uh, para iniciar su carrera docente a la Universidad de Harvard como profesor ayudante de química biológica y al año siguiente ya fue nombrado catedrático de biología estructural en la Universidad de Stanford, uh, posición que ocupa en la actualidad. Desde 1986 es, uh, es además profesor de la Universidad hebrea de Jerusalén y miembro del Instituto Alexander eh, Silverman para Ciencias de la Unidad. Allí pasa todos los años unos dos meses en verano. Está en posesión de un gran número de premios, aquí tenemos una pequeña lista de los mismos y entre los cuales figura el Nobel de Química que le fue concedido en el año 2006 por sus estudios de las bases moleculares de la transcripción eucariótica. La, tra la transcripción es una de las eh, etapas claves mediante las cuales las células lo que hacen es copiar el ADN para dar lugar a la formación del ácido ribonucleico mensajero. Este proceso es eh, catalizado por un complejo uh, proteico que es la polimerasa de tipo 2. Este proceso es muy flexible y permite obtener a través de la segunda etapa que es la traducción diversos tipos de proteínas. Y uh, la flexibilidad de este proceso permite que a partir de una célula uh, madre se puedan generar diversos tipos de células, como pueden ser las neuronales, las sanguíneas, las epidérmicas y las musculares. Pues bien, el trabajo eh, principal del profesor Humbert en este campo fue el de estudiar la uh, máquina que lleva a cabo este proceso de transcripción, que es la polimerasa de tipo 2. Él recibió el consejo de Crick, de que para eh, conocer bien el mecanismo de funcionamiento de algo, de una máquina, lo primero que hay que hacer es saber de qué componentes, eh, qué componentes son los que posee. Y él utilizando métodos bioquímicos avanzados y en especial eh, la eh, difracción de rayos X, consiguió, por decirlo así, fotografiar esta polimerasa de tipo 2 en funcionamiento y ello le permitió poder establecer perfectamente eh, la posición de los distintos átomos de esta compleja molécula. Así pues, uh, thank you very much for coming to Santiago de Compostela under this special program Conciencia. For us it's a great pleasure that uh, you have made uh, such a big effort to come here and we hope uh, you are going to enjoy very much uh, 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 your visit and we look forward for uh, future visits to Santiago. Uh, I, I remember that uh, I knew your father about 30 years ago, he was about your age now, and uh, he was, I found him also a very nice and very uh, pleasant, pleasant uh, person. So I remember dining in the Rua del Franco and also in another restaurant, and uh, was really very cordial, the dinner, etc. So now I leave your, your time, Professor Camber, for, uh, for you to present in your interesting lecture, Basic Science, the, uh, hope of, the Hope for Progress. Thank you.
first of all, I thank you, Luis, for this warm and most generous introduction. Um, I'd like also on behalf of my wife, Yali Lorch, and my son, Gil, to thank you, uh, Professor Jorge Mira, uh, for the invitation to participate in this important program. Uh, I wish to acknowledge both the inspiration uh, as well as uh, the invitation. It is truly an honor to take part. Uh, I see it as an important event, uh, one that I think uh, has a purpose that extends far beyond uh, the occasion itself uh, and that I hope will be emulated uh, elsewhere around the world for the benefit of science and for us all. Now, I believe that everyone in this audience knows that the history of man is a tale of conquest, of endless conquest. Uh, a conquest sometimes by force of arms, uh, sometimes by force of ideas. Now, history has shown that ideas are ultimately more powerful and, as we all know, more rewarding. Uh, I'll speak to you today about a specific example ideas in biology and the conquest of disease. Of course, similar examples could be given in other areas, indeed almost any area of intellectual activity. And I'll begin by borrowing from a lecture I heard given some years ago by Sir Paul Nurse, uh, who is credited with discovering the fundamental basis of the cell division cycle. Uh, he gave a lecture in which he identified four great ideas in biology. Now, great ideas in biology may sound like what is called in English an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, uh, like jumbo shrimp or military intelligence. <laughs> uh, you may think of biology as primarily an empirical science, in contrast, for example, with physics, uh, which is much more a theoretical science and obviously much more connected uh, with thought and ideas. But there have been great ideas in the history of biology. Most of you would know all of them, would probably name them, uh, no matter what your background or point of view. Uh, the first of these four great ideas, the cell, the unit of life. There are 100 trillion cells in a human being, but a single cell is the simplest living thing. This was first recognized by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century. Uh, Leeuwenhoek was an unlikely scientist. He was a Dutch tradesman of no fortune, no higher education, indeed no university degree. Uh, nevertheless, he made some of the most important discoveries in the history of biology. He discovered bacteria. He discovered free-living and parasitic uh, protists, sperm cells, blood cells, nematode worms, and much more. He founded the field of microbiology. In, 19 se six, in, excuse me, in 1676, he served as the trustee of the deceased and bankrupt Jan Vermeer, a painter of the picture that you see here on the right. Vermeer was born in the same year as Leeuwenhoek and is thought to have been a close friend. Uh, at some time before 1668, I should add that uh, this very famous picture uh, by Vermeer is thought to have been an image of Leeuwenhoek himself. Now, at some time before 1668, Leeuwenhoek learned to do grind lenses. He made simple microscopes and began making observations. Soon after, he began writing letters to the newly formed Royal Society of London describing what he saw. And in a letter of 1683, he wrote about observations he made on material taken from between his own teeth. Uh, he said, I almost always saw with great wonder that there were very many little living animal cules, very pretty moving. The biggest sort had a strong and swift motion. The second sort often spun round like a top. In the mouth of an old man, Leeuwenhoek had found, quote, an unbelievably great company of living things. 
the animalcules were in such enormous numbers, all the water seemed to be alive. These were among the first observations of living bacteria ever recorded. I'll return to the practical significance, their importance to all of us to this day, uh, in a short while in this lecture. But I'd like to go on now to what Paul Nurse identified, and you would also agree, uh, was the second great idea <coughs> in the history of biology, namely that of genes. Now this important idea was due to an Augustinian monk by the name of Gregor Mendel. Mendel was a high school science teacher. Uh, his interest in science was based on a simple love of nature. He often wondered how plants acquired their characteristics, and in particular, atypical or unusual characteristics. On his walks around the monastery, uh, he found one day an atypical variety of an ornamental plant. Uh, he decided to place it next to one of the, tip of the usual variety and grow them side by side to see if the progeny if the progeny acquired the atypical traits. The experiment was, quote, designed to support or to illustrate Lamarck's views concerning the influence of environment upon plants. On the contrary, what Mendel discovered was that plants' offspring retained the traits of their parents. They were not, in fact, influenced by environment. And this simple test that he performed gave birth to the idea of genes and of heredity. Uh, Mendel, of course, went on to do much more. He showed that traits were inherited in certain numerical ratios. Uh, and these led to the basic laws of heredity. That hereditary factors, <coughs> genes, do not combine but are passed intact. Each member of the parental generation transmits only half of its hereditary factors to each offspring. Mendel's work laid the foundation for modern genetics. A short monograph on the subject called Experiments with Plant Hybrids, uh, which he published in 1866, was one of the most enduring and influential publications in the history of science. Nevertheless, it was immediately forgotten after publication, only rediscovered some 40 years later. In the meanwhile, the next great idea uh, was reported, uh, the next great idea, that of evolution, again well known to all of you, and due, of course, uh, to Charles Darwin. Uh, because so much is written about Darwin in this uh, bicentennial year, I won't dwell on the subject. Um, suffice it to say, genes uh, discovered by Mendel acting through natural selection have given rise to the cells discovered by Leeuwenhoek and indeed all life as we know it. The last of Paul Nurse's four great ideas in biology uh, was also the last to be discovered. Um, it is the most fundamental. Uh, it underlies all the others. Um, it leads to the rest of what I have to tell you. It is truly the guiding principle in biology and in medicine today. Uh, this was the idea of life as chemistry. The idea and its consequences rose, arose in a uh, somewhat of a strange way from the work of uh, the great French chemist and biochemist Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was responsible both for creating the idea of life as chemistry and also for preventing its acceptance, um, preventing its pursuit for nearly 25 years. Now, Pasteur, like uh, Leeuwenhoek and Mendel, uh, had a modest background. He was the son of a poorly educated tanner. Um, his own research began with the extension of cell theory, the microbiology of Leeuwenhoek. Um, he uh, extended cell theory uh, along with others to elaborate the germ theory of disease. He showed microbes were responsible for the spoilage of milk uh, and other beverages. And with this, he invented a process to kill the microbes uh, and thus to protect 
the milk against spoilage, a process that is still used today and that we know as pasteurization. Now, beverage contamination led Pasteur to conclude that microorganisms might also affect animals and humans. He proposed preventing the entry of microorganisms into the human body, uh, and this led Joseph Lister to develop antiseptic methods in surgery. Pasteur wasn't actually the first to think of germ theory, but he did develop it, and he conducted experiments that uh, most uh, clearly indicated its correctness, and it was he who managed to convince most of Europe that it was true. He's often regarded, therefore, as the father of germ theory, along with Robert Koch. Uh, this uh, important idea, of course, had many consequences that we know well. Vaccines, uh, the role of fermentation, uh, for example, in winemaking from yeast. Fermentation refers to the conversion of sugar to alcohol by yeast. Uh, and when Pasteur realized this was the role of yeast in the process, uh, then he asked the next question. Um, is it a property, is it a characteristic only of a living, of an intact yeast cell, or can it be brought about by some uh, internal component of a yeast? Uh, through his interest in this question, Pasteur addressed what was one of the fundamental issues of his time, of uh, the question of vitalism. Uh, several hundred years before, it had been argued that matter exists in two radically different forms, uh, distinguishable, for example, by their behavior with regard to heat. Uh, these two forms of matter were termed organic and inorganic. Inorganic ma material, like a lump of metal, could be melted by heat, uh, but could then be restored to its original condition uh, by cooling, by removing the heat. In contrast, organic material, like egg white, was cooked when heated, changing it to a new form that could not be restored. It was argued the essential difference between organic and inorganic material was a vital force present only in living things. So Pasteur then asked whether fermentation uh, required a vital force. Uh, does it require a living yeast? Is it a property only of a living thing? He broke open the yeast and found that the juice was not capable of converting sugar to alcohol. He concluded that, in fact, an intact yeast cell was required, that fermentation was a special property of a living organism, an example of the vital force. It was this experiment that delayed the recognition of life as chemistry for a quarter century. We now know that fermentation, like every other transformation in living things uh, is brought about through the action of proteins, proteins that catalyze chemical reactions, proteins that are known as enzymes. Pasteur's experiment failed because one of the enzymes in the extract from his yeast was unstable, uh, and thus the entire process of fermentation in the yeast cell extract failed. Eventually, the experiment was repeated by Eduard Buchner. He used another type of yeast in which all enzymes required for fermentation survived the process of cell breakage and extraction. He succeeded where Pasteur had failed. And for this experiment, Buchner received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1907. And at that time, he wrote, and I quote, we all grew up in the atmosphere of Pasteur's views. I hence understandably, understandably was very skeptical when I obtained experimental facts that appeared to indicate cell-free fermentation. Now, the rest, as they say, is history. The research of scientists around the world during the 100 years since Buchner's discovery has identified many of the enzymes responsible for virtually all the activities of living things. I'll give you one example uh, from my own experience. 
Uh, perhaps the most remarkable enzymes are those responsible for the action of the genes discovered by Gregor Mendel. Uh, these are the enzymes that enable genes uh, to give rise to the form and the function of all living things. Most of you will know from the popular press, uh, if not from your own studies, that genes are made up of DNA, or I think in Spanish I saw it's written ADN. And you will also have heard of the double helical structure of DNA. You may know that DNA is made of two intertwined strands of chemical material. And you may furthermore be aware that chemical appendages attached to the strands are of four types. They are referred to by four letter names, and their order constitutes the so-called genetic code. The information in DNA is brought to life, uh, is used to direct the activities of living things in a two-step process. It is first copied into a form uh, in English called RNA, I assume in Spanish ARN. Uh, this is referred to as the genetic message, after which it is translated into a different form, that of protein. Transcription, the first step, in which the information is copied into another form, a very closely related chemical form, goes by the name transcription, which has almost the same definition, or uh, goes almost, for which there is almost an identical word I see in Spanish. So transcription represents literally, as the word implies, copying information. It is accomplished by the enzyme RNA polymerase, which uh, makes a chemical strand uh, with the identical sequence, the same genetic code as that in the DNA. The product of transcription is shown here in the blue line. It is literally copied from the DNA in the black line. Finally, as I have said, that information is translated into the form called protein. A protein is also a chain of building blocks. Uh, there are 20 different kinds. They are symbolized here by only two different forms, open and closed circles. The 20 forms of building blocks of protein chains, whose order is determined by the genetic code, uh, are capable of folding upon themselves to form a compact entity, uh, which uh, has the properties, as I have told you, of enzymes and also performs other roles in the body. Proteins are sometimes symbolized in this manner by a worm-like chain. Uh, proteins, as I have said, fold up and in their compact form uh, may sometimes be represented as shown here on the right. Now, in my own work, uh, done uh, with more than 100 colleagues, at Stanford University, including, most importantly, my wife, Dr. Yali Lorch, uh, we have determined the arrangement of the proteins, indeed of all the atoms, in the molecule responsible for <coughs> transcription, RNA polymerase. This enzyme is actually made of 10 different proteins. It is still one of the largest uh, discovered in nature. Uh, we uh, found by means I won't uh, describe in detail the location of every one of 28,000 carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms in these 10 proteins. This resulted in a picture uh, of RNA polymerase in the act of copying the genetic material. Here you actually see um, in a true 
X-ray photograph of RNA polymerase, the DNA double helix as it enters. Uh, then you see one strand in blue copied into RNA that is shown in red. Now, this picture is partially symbolic of the arrangement of atoms. Uh, you don't see here that it's all 28,000 atoms, but rather the path of the protein traced through the chain of atoms. Sorry. And also the path of the two strands of the R of DNA and of the RNA traced through uh, the picture of the 28,000 atoms. Uh, it is most convenient to view in the symbolic form. It has the consequence that I've mentioned. Again, to repeat, it represents an actual picture of RNA polymerase in the process of reading the genetic material, the genetic information of DNA into the form of a message called RNA. Now, the importance of such a picture of RNA polymerase caught in the literal act of reading genetic information. It enables us both to understand the mechanism of the process and thereby to gain a degree of control over the process. Because transcription is the first step in the pathway of gene expression, of the realization of genetic information in the form and function of all living things, it is a focal point of regulation. Um, it is at the stage of transcription that the key decision is made whether information in a gene will be used and also to what extent. So as you have heard in the introduction from Luis Castedo, uh, it is the decision which genes to transcribe that determines the fate of a stem cell. It is mistakes made in that process that lead to cancer. Uh, the control over transcription that we have begun to gain through studies of transcription at the atomic level uh, will ultimately enable us to cure a great many, if not all, of human disease. On that, uh, with that, let me turn from ideas in biology, the particular example of our own work on transcription, uh, from the principles of life science to their application in medicine. Now, it may surprise you to know that medical science really only began 100 years ago with the work of Pasteur, Buchner, and those who followed. Whereas physics and chemistry began centuries before, Human biology was until recently entirely neglected. Human disease was attributed to an imbalance of humors. And the only cures, the only treatments for disease that were available were bleeding and violent purgatives. Doctors were scarcely educated men. Soon after Pasteur and Buchner, the president of Harvard University proposed adding uh, the nascent, of the, the very beginning of medical science, to the curriculum at Harvard Medical School. A noted surgeon on the faculty objected that this would be impossible because few of the students could read or write. Today, medical science stands as one important triumph of human intellect and really the greatest frontier for intellectual activity in the future. We will one day understand every aspect of human life in chemical terms and physical terms. And with that understanding will, as I have said, come control over disease, over behavior, uh, we hope over intolerance and aggression, perhaps even over aging and the future of humankind. Now, it is the work of the recent past then, of uh, the last hundred years, that show how this great promise will be achieved. If I were to ask any member of this audience to name the important advances in medicine since Pasteur over the last hundred years, I'm sure almost everyone would make the same list. Uh, you would think of x-rays, uh, important for both diagnosis and treatment. Uh, you would certainly think of antibiotics, which have largely eradicated bacterial disease. 
Um, many would, uh, I think, suggest non-invasive imaging. Uh, for example, magnetic <coughs> resonance imaging for early detection of cancer and other conditions. Uh, more recently, genetic engineering, which is the basis of most new medicines. The list could go on. These medical advances all have one thing in common. They were all discoveries that were made in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake with no notion, no idea of any applications, no purpose in the cure of disease. So the lesson of the past is counterintuitive. It is to solve a difficult problem in medical science, don't study it directly, rather pursue a curiosity about nature and the rest will follow. Do basic research. Now to emphasize the point, I'd like to take just a minute or two and examine a couple of the examples that I gave in more detail, x-rays and antibiotics. X-rays were discovered by William Rentgen, who um, was also a man of modest beginnings. Uh, he was the child of a textile merchant in the Netherlands. At age 18, he was permanently expelled from school for refusing to inform on a classmate who had drawn a character, character of a teacher, and he was never allowed to attend any educational institution again. Nevertheless, uh, he went on to become eventually a distinguished physicist. He held the chair in physics at the University of Würzburg, where in 1895, uh, he was investigating the effects of elect electrical discharge in a cathode ray tube. And he happened to notice, uh, upon such a discharge, a faint light on a fluorescent screen standing elsewhere in his laboratory. Um, this was true even when the cathode ray tube was covered with black cloth. He referred to the radiation of unknown origin as X-rays. Um, in appreciation of his work, uh, they were called by others Röntgen rays, and they're still called by that name in Germany, but the rest of us, I think, know them as X-rays. And soon thereafter, while holding various materials in front of the cathode ray tube to test if they could block x-rays, he saw the skeleton of his own hand on the fluorescent screen. Uh, within a couple of years, x-rays found important application in medicine. And in 1901, uh, Rankin was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics. Now, turning briefly to antibiotics, uh, many of you have heard the famous story of Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin. But what you may not know, it was a previous chance finding made by Fleming that formed the basis of the discovery of penicillin. You may also not know that Fleming never pursued the medical application of penicillin, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Fleming was a professor of bacteriology at St. Mary's Hospital in London. Uh, he was at the time growing bacteria that cause disease in a dish to investigate their properties and to search for cures. Uh, in 1922, uh, he uh, had a bad cold and a drop fell from his nose into the dish and he saw that it killed the bacteria. Um, he traced that effect to a human protein, an enzyme, to which he gave the name lysozyme. Proteins are, or at least were at the time, uh, generally unsuitable for medical use, uh, but it raised in his mind at least the possibility of an antibacterial agent. And then, uh, when about a decade later, he noticed that a mold growing in one of his uh, petri dishes, one of his dishes of bacteria, uh, had killed bacteria that uh, were growing nearby, um, he was inspired to pursue the observation. Uh, he sought to isolate the active agent for medical use. He named it penicillin, but failed in the isolation because of its instability. He wrote a paper on his findings. Like that of Mendel, it was also forgotten. Only fortunately, in this case, it had been read by a, a true genius by the name of Ernst Chain. 
who could remember Flor uh, Fleming's paper in an appropriate time a short while later. Um, it was about a decade later when at Oxford, uh, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain were investigating lysozyme. They were interested in its action upon uh, the target of lysozyme, the bacterial cell wall. Florey, Howard Florey, was the son of a shoemaker in Australia. He'd come to England on a Rhodes Scholarship and rose through the ranks to become director of the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology. Chain was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He was a musical as well as a scientific genius. Uh, he was Flory's first employee at Oxford. And the two decided uh, to uh, pursue Fleming's observations on lysozyme and seek other such protein uh, antibacterial agents from other bacteria. It was Chain who then remembered having read Fleming's publication on penicillin and set about its isolation. He overcame the problem of instability uh, discovered both the uniqueness of penicillin and its extraordinary potential for medical use. Uh, this led after the eventual commercial production of penicillin uh, and its use uh, for the cure of bacterial disease uh, to the award of the 1945 Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, to Fleming, Florey, and Chain. Now, these brief accounts of both the discovery of x-rays and the discovery of antibiotics, I think, served to reinforce what I said before, the crucial role of basic, of untargeted research. Um, they help, I think, to illuminate the process of discovery. Uh, the work is inevitably done by individuals, uh, by individuals who are free to explore and to follow uh, a scientific path wherever it may lead. All such paths will lead ultimately, if pursued far enough, to underlying principles, uh, to the fundamental truths of nature. And it's from this knowledge, uh, from deep understanding, that all practical benefit derives. Discovery is the true engine of progress. Discovery and its offspring, technology, are all that separate us from our original primitive condition. Discovery is the hope of progress in the future. Now, the importance of discovery for medical, for economic, and even military benefit has not been lost on government and central planners. The problem is that discoveries, by their very nature, cannot be planned. They arise, as I have told you, from untargeted research. They arise by serendipity, as in the work of Rentkin, Fleming and others. The only way to assure that they will arise for our benefit in the future is by the support of talented individuals, uh, especially by government, in the unfettered pursuit of knowledge. This important fact, so well established by experience of the past century, is often forgotten by people in government and in industry who desire greater and more immediate practical benefits. I can remember from my own childhood hearing the pre American President Lyndon Johnson speaking about life-saving discoveries locked up in the laboratory. Uh, it was a serious sentiment, but it was entirely mistaken. The application of existing knowledge is not the limiting factor. The knowledge itself is limiting. Even today, to take the example that I have given in this lecture of the human body, we know less, far less than 1% of all that we may eventually hope to learn. Now consider how enormous have been the benefits to our health and to economies from the less than 1% that we know. And imagine how great would be the benefits from learning the remaining 99%. Finally, I'll conclude on more of a personal note with what is perhaps the most important reason uh, for the pursuit of basic science. The goal, of course, is to explain fundamental mysteries of our existence and of our universe. And in this respect, 
science resembles religion, although the conclusions that are reached are so profoundly different. But what is remarkable is that we try it all, that we try to understand, that we feel impelled to do so. We expend enormous effort to do so. We will often take grave risks, uh, endure great suffering to do so. Obvious examples are the exploration of earthly and outer space, the creation of art and literature, to name just a few. The immediate objective is always the same. It is accomplishment. It is testing the limits of the possible and knowing what lies beyond. The rewards are almost entirely personal. The satisfaction is extraordinary. It really lies beyond words. And with that, I thank you. Creo que you can have the transition here. Si alguien quiere preguntar algo. Hay por el micrófono, me parece. Bueno, si alguien se anima, yo tengo una pregunta. Para ver si la gente se anima. Eh, vos te he dicho que el descubrimiento o la sua propia naturaleza no se puede ir a buscar como objetivos. Entonces, en ese contexto, ¿cómo se contempla un proyecto de investigación que eleva objetivos fijados, que eleva una trayectoria perfectamente pautada y que realmente, bueno, un investigador cuando se propone pedir un proyecto tiene que redactar lo que vaya a hacer y casi lo que vaya a descubrir? Entonces, realmente, desde el punto de vista político, es un problema esta perspectiva. Si usted fuese o presidente de los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica, ¿qué medidas tomaría un departamento asociado? Por ejemplo, el Departamento de Energía o NIH, que son los departamentos que en Estados Unidos llevan esta investigación. Uh, that's really uh, an excellent, in fact, even, even if you will, the key question. And uh, the answer is interesting and, like the problem that I pose, also paradoxical in a way. So, I'll explain uh, the way in which uh, the problem is, so to speak, solved by NIH, which you mentioned. Uh, and I think this would apply uh, to government agencies that support research uh, in Spain, elsewhere in Europe, but I know particularly the example of NIH. Of course, one can only uh, apply uh, to do research for some purpose. And so research grants do, in fact, state, applications do, in fact, state specific goals. They even propose methods uh, and would appear to obligate uh, the recipient to follow a prescribed path. Mm -hmm. In fact, what most of us do after receiving the money is to throw away the application <laughs> and to do uh, whatever the spirit moves. Uh, we are, of course, taking a risk if we don't succeed then at the end of the time, uh, the government will ask uh, uh, about the goals that were not achieved and uh, be unlikely to award another period of misdirected support. Fortunately, most of the time, uh, because of the nature of science and the caliber of the very many scientists all around the world who receive money uh, from the public purse to undertake such activity, uh, something of interest 
something surprising uh, will emerge, and that will justify the effort. It will more than justify the application of funds and serve as a basis for the next round of specific application for a prescribed purpose <laughs> to do something of a particular nature. Bragan is a chemist from the University of Coruña. He works in my group, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky man. <laughs> yes. Uh, muchos de los descubrimientos que hemos visto han sido hechos por gente que no tenía una formación reglada. Eh, ¿Cree que se le da mucha importancia hoy en día a tener una formación reglada? Una licenciatura, un doctorado. Un postdoc. Un postdoc. Sí. So I think that uh, the point you make is important and I might uh, call attention to it in a different way. Um, the main activity of a graduate student in the pursuit of a degree uh, I think is not to acquire specific knowledge or to learn particular methods uh, but to gain both experience and what is more important, confidence in the pursuit of research. So the individual, having completed the training, will have the courage to do what I told you, namely to throw away the original proposal, <laughs> take the risk of charting a new path, and ultimately discover something. So the answer to your question is, on the one hand, uh, virtually nothing is required except the desire, uh, the determination, the persistence uh, to pursue a research direction and ultimately succeed. Uh, nothing except, as I say, the confidence, the belief in oneself which one gains uh, from academic training. Uh, I think it's noteworthy that in your field, in physics, so many of the great ideas, so much of the important work has been done by comparatively young people. It seems not uh, to depend only upon accumulated knowledge, in which case the most important work will be done by the oldest investigators. Uh, to use the language of your field, young physicists may be delta functions. They can know all there is to know about an area which is infinitely narrow, uh, and in that way uh, rise to great heights and make important, new, uh, profoundly significant findings. Estes días eh, os medios de comunicación quedaron bastante sorprendidos con as súas declaracións posto que dixo que a solución aos problemas por exemplo, a solución ás enfermidades que hai no mundo é un problema básicamente político e económico e non científico cando foi pois, interpelado polos periodistas ratificou as súas palabras dicindo que se o investimento fosse suficientemente grande, prácticamente ninguna enfermidade resistiría o avance da ciencia. E eso, por que non se arregla? Se eso está tan claro, por que eh, esa idea non se transmite a población e por que non chega aos políticos para solucionarlo unha vez por todas? Cal sería a medida para que eso chegase realmente ao poder político e que paso servía a quedar para que eso chegase ao poder político? What you say is uh, extraordinarily and remarkably true. And just to give an example, uh, the entire, mo most of the support for cancer research in the world today comes from the NIH. Uh, the budget for cancer research, uh, the funds that are spent by the NIH on cancer research are about $5 billion a year. 
And to put that in perspective, the amount of money spent on soft drinks in the United States is about $80 billion a year. Uh, it gives a sense of our priorities and underlines the issue that uh, you have raised. I think the, uh, the, the problem, uh, the reason for this difficulty is because of the long time frame. Uh, because the time between discovery and implementation, uh, the time between discovery uh, that relates to medicine and the cure of a disease may be very long. So the notion, uh, the idea of an abstraction, the, the idea of a connection between them is abstract. I mean, like the, uh, the abstract notion of a connection between our conception and uh, birth of a child uh, fortunately, only nine months, so the connection was made long ago. But uh, in this case, it may be 25 years or even longer. Uh, and uh, the question is, who will uh, appreciate there is such a connection, not to mention be willing to make such a far-sighted investment? Uh, the answer, of course, is that no pharmaceutical company will do so. Uh, no self-respecting CEO would report to his board of directors that he had made an investment in research that will take 25 years to yield any profit for the company. Uh, to give you a somewhat uh, chilling and very real case in point, uh, a noted oncologist in the United States told me he sees examples of anti-cancer drugs uh, that are under consideration by pharmaceutical companies uh, he sees choices that must be made uh, between drugs that will cure cancer of a particular type in a single dose and drugs that must be administered weekly and only prolong life by a year or two. And he told me that that decision is made on a frequent basis and the CEO always makes the right business decision and chooses the latter type of drug usually killing the first, uh, which will then disappear from any possibility of eventual application. So the answer is that the solution to the problem, first of all, requires action by governments on behalf of the people. Only governments will take such far-sighted actions. And it depends, depends particularly on the existence and the elaboration and the success of programs such as this Consensia to bring such concerns uh, to the attention of the people, so they will bring appropriate pressure upon their governments to make such investments. Uh, what is NIH? NIH stands for National Institutes of Health, and it's an organization uh, that is uh, supported by, uh, in the, it, it was originally an institution only of the American government, uh, which was located in uh, near Washington, D.C., and had the purpose of uh, doing both research and applying results to medicine. In 1950, for the first time, uh, the NIH instituted what is called an extramural research support program where uh, research grants were made uh, to individuals uh, outside of the actual premises, the location of the NIH itself. Uh, those research grants have given rise to biomedical science as we know it today. They were at that time and they still are granted without regard to nationality or even location in the world. So there are many investigators in Spain, elsewhere in Europe, as well as in America, all of whom compete on an equal basis for grant support by the NIH. Um, it's uh, a, an institution that uh, we struggle to conserve against the political forces, which are, you will realize, always countervailing, uh, and an institution which um, has been, to some extent, uh, replicated and needs to be done so to an even greater extent elsewhere around the world. Professor Luis Liz is from the University of Vigo. He's a brilliant scientist in Galicia. He's, I think, the most cited scientist in the, current, in the recent times. Well, if you think I was going to talk about this, I wouldn't have asked. 
A miña pregunta en realidad é vai dirigida a ese tipo de actitudes dos científicos. É dicir, nos exemplos que mostrou o profesor Convert, non había probablemente un problema de vanidade das persoas que facían os descubrimentos. Mentres que, hoxe en día, a maior parte dos científicos, como a min, somos todos moi vanidosos, todos queremos levar o mérito de todas as cousas que facemos. Quería conhecer a súa opinión acerca de como isto influe negativa ou positivamente no desenvolvimento da ciencia. It's an interesting question. Actually, I um, would uh, gently disagree with uh, the first part of what you said. I don't think human nature has changed. <laughs> I think that uh, we are really no different from uh, Pasteur or from Chain or Fleming or others in this regard. Uh, Pasteur was, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, greatly successful, uh, Newton before him, in achieving fame, in part because he craved it, uh, in part because he was not only uh, a brilliant scientist, but also a brilliant communicator, and finally, a kind of demagogue who destroyed anyone who opposed him. Uh, witnessed the fact that his word was so powerful, no one dared oppose him for all those years until Buchner uh, finally repeated that fateful experiment. Uh, I would absolutely agree with you that uh, the various forms this take are unseemly and not to be admired, and I think prizes in general are a bad thing. They do more harm than good. Nevertheless, we have human nature. Uh, we can't change it. These things will always be with us, so we try and make the best of it, uh, which is why it's important for distinguished scientists such as yourself, your colleague who won the Jaime Primero Prize here, uh, recently uh, in Santiago uh, to uh, be encumbered to feel uh, the obligation to speak out on behalf of all fellow scientists uh, and try and achieve what we all agree are laudable ends. Professor Ruiz, he's a physicist. You might, you may think that I know everybody here. <laughs> As you see, my friends are asking. I have not asked them to make questions. Um, uh, do you think uh, we will be? Piensa que seremos capaces de controlar el poder que el conocimiento científico, la biología, nos puede conferir en el futuro. Por ejemplo, estoy pensando en el terrorismo o en un accidente biológico. ¿Qué piensas al respecto? ¿Es optimista o pesimista? So, let me first of all say what, of course, you know well, but it may be useful to repeat for the benefit of others. Uh, our role, yours, mine, as scientists, is to discover information. Um, it's for society to decide upon its application. Uh, scientists are no better or worse than anyone else in that regard. We have no greater capability of making such decisions. Um, the ethical ones really belong to the society. Uh, will society prove capable of making the right choices? Uh, that is another question entirely. I, I'm reminded of uh, the opening lines of, of an address of, of a, a speech to graduates given by the great American comedian Woody Allen in which he said mankind has reached a crossroads. Uh, one path leads uh, to uh, utter despair and dejection. Uh, the other leads to total extinction. I hope we'll have the wisdom to make the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's all we can do is hope that humankind has the wisdom to make the right choice. Sol Betero is another physicist. He was, he, he, he was the, the person who was in your presentation. Sí, una pregunta muy difícil. Eh, yo quería, aprovechando el, el escenario que estaban eh, contando sobre la investigación y la importancia política, querría preguntarle al profesor que en ese escenario, ¿cuál sería la importancia de, la, de las universidades? Eh, aprovechando que está aquí el señor eh, rector, que le que le pida también eh, desde su puesto eh, 
lo que tenga que pedir. Una casa. <laughs> uh, I would note just a couple of things in answer to your important question. The first is uh, that we must remember to regard universities not only as uh, places of teaching and learning, but also as the institutes for research. Ultimately, the most important role of a university is not just to uh, transmit, to pass on knowledge, but to enlarge knowledge. Uh, for this, we require as many able investigators supported in as many laboratories as possible. And the challenge to universities all around the world uh, is to enlarge their faculties to the extent possible uh, and to give those uh, who are then uh, offered the opportunity of doing research, uh, the best conditions for doing so. The, uh, the further point that uh, I would just make very briefly in, in this regard uh, concerns the mechanism by which funds are allocated. Uh, it's, it's, if you will, another uh, lesson to be learned from the fortunate example of NIH. Um, always in the past, until 1950, uh, what research funds were available uh, were, for the most part, uh, provided through universities um, to investigators, and decisions were made within the university. Uh, the allocation of, ones, of funds was therefore fundamentally hierarchical in nature. Um, the funds filtered down from the top. Uh, it was the role of the most senior members to decide which junior members uh, would be enabled to pursue their ideas, uh, and indeed even which ideas they might pursue. The NIH system is the opposite. Uh, NIH grants are open uh, to competition by all on an equal basis. So I myself must compete on an equal basis with beginning assistant professors everywhere in the world uh, on the strength of the application I write and I hope the quality of the ideas. Sometimes I succeed, more often I fail. Um, that is as it should be. Uh, nothing that I or anyone of my age or like me uh, before or after me uh, should make any difference except the quality of the ideas. Professor Fraga, he's the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. La sociedad busca individuos sanos genéticamente. La sociedad busca individuos sanos genéticamente. Eh, ¿Cómo se contrapone esto con la libertad del individuo a tener genes que puedan enfermar? I think what you point to is uh, one of the uh, alternative, if you will, the uh, un, uh, potentially deleterious aspects of discovering genetic information. And this is something much debated uh, and for which mechanisms have still not been adequately developed. So it is a concern that many of us have, uh, indeed in the United States today, as health policy is being formulated uh, and the system of health insurance in the nation revised, um, how indeed to protect against the very thing you've mentioned. I mean, we would all agree that no one should be placed at a disadvantage because of their genetic background, uh, but I don't think that we yet have, um, I don't know whether a mechanism has been found in Spain uh, to protect uh, individuals against that kind of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Sí, antes dijo, vino a decir que las farmacéuticas no nos iban a intentar curar del todo, sino hacer un, que nos quedáramos con una enfermedad crónica. ¿De verdad? Entonces, ¿cree que debería de subvencionarse la investigación a partir de, la, quiero decir, dándole dinero a las farmacéuticas? So uh, having 
uh, made such critical remarks about pharmaceutical industry, let me now say a word in their defense. Uh, if the NIH invests five, ten billion dollars a year in all of medicine, uh, five in cancer research, ten in all of medicine, uh, pharmaceutical companies invest uh, some two hundred billion dollars a year in uh, bringing the uh, results, the discoveries, uh, to which I alluded, uh, to the public in the form of the many treatments for disease. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, are not, in fact, uh, the appropriate organization for a discovery, but they do represent a most efficient engine for translation of discoveries uh, for medical purposes. Uh, it may be that these discoveries have to be taken a stage further with the support of government uh, so that their value for uh, the cure of disease is both um, discovered, is, is found, and made public. Um, if the drugs to which I alluded that can cure cancer uh, were found under the auspices of a governmental organization, they would be reported in the scientific literature. Uh, they could never be lost, and there would be uh, a financial opportunity, much less, of course, than what the company seek, but nevertheless for some, uh, to implement and market them, and it would happen. So again, uh, the companies do what is appropriate and what they do best. Uh, government has an important role to play, and it should perhaps be enlarged, and if extended even a stage further than what is done today, would fill that important gap. ¿Alguna mano levantada? Bueno, pues si alguien levanta mano, creo que es un buen momento para poner de fin a este interesante coloquio en el que se convirtió esta reunión. Quiero agradeceros a todos a vuestra asistencia. También quiero agradecer a la comunidad de Twenty y de Facebook, que es muy activa, por lo menos, en las inscripciones en este programa. Eh, bueno, emplazarnos para dentro de unos meses, cuando anunciemos los actos de premio Fonseca, que nos aprobamos el programa de paciencia. Quiero pedir un aplauso para el profesor Carlos.